Um, so welcome to everyone. Um, really good to see you all. Um, my name's um, Jane Manning. I'm joint editor of um, Urban Design Magazine for the Urban Design Group and really, really pleased to um, welcome you here today for the launch of eco-responsive environments. And I think we're going to have a really good um, discussion um, this afternoon. We've got um, Soham, one of the authors, is going to take us through um, and sort of give us a glimpse into the book. Um, and then we'll have a good sort of chance for um, discussion afterwards. Um, it's It sort of marks quite an exciting moment, I think, the sort of launch of this book. You know, for most of us on the call, um, responsive environments um, has been a core part of the urban design um, canon and sort of a bit a sort of big part of what sort of steered lots of the work that we do um, and that's very much been the case since its publication in 1985 and so sort of almost 40 years ago now eco responsive environments provides a sort of a really important kind of update and a sort of significant move so a sort of new frame of reference where we are bringing in natural systems to that understanding of people-friendly settlements. Um, and so it's a significant move on. It's a huge piece of work and a, a work that the four authors have um, put a huge amount of effort in. And I think the book is very much kind of testament to that effort and also a great thing for all of us that they have done all of the work and we now get to absorb um, all of that. Um, the authors, so um, Ian Bentley and Sue McGlynn, two of the authors from the original Responsive Environments, um, were joined then with um, Sam D and um, Prachi Rampura, and they are um, together the authors of this. Um, so we're joined by Sue McGlynn and Sam and Prachi as authors, that, having sadly lost um, Ian Bentley during the process of the book. Um, and I think you know, all of you will know um, Sue McGlynn well, um, a really well-known author, um, and for many of you on the call um, will have been taught by Sue um, while at Oxford Brooks. Um, and Soham and Prachi um, both went through Oxford Brooks, and so it's very much a sort of bringing, bringing together of um, the thought process. And all three of the authors um, that we're joined by today have very much brought together sort of teaching in academia with practice and so there's a sort of really strong kind of sense of a sort of authoritativeness that comes with that as well. Um, I will hand over um, shortly to Sam who's going to take the lead in taking us through um, the book but it would be great to sort of just do a very quick introduction um, if each of you want to do that um, and and what I wanted to just say is sort of lastly is it would be really great if as Soham's going through, if you've got questions, if you can note those down, perhaps don't put them in the chat because it can be quite distracting as we go through, but make sure you've made a note of them. And we'd really like to kind of get that discussion and debate going at the end of it. So I'll kind of bring all of you in, put your hands up as you want to speak. Um, so Soham, do you want to introduce yourself first and then go through Prachi and Sue and then back to you? So um, I'll try and keep it really brief. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Soham Day, um, co-authors of this book, um, and also uh, together myself and Prachi, we co-founded a practice called Eco-Responsive Environments, uh, after the name of the book, really. Um, we are based in um, South London, well, Brixton to be more specific, um, and we, uh, well, I also teach at um, Oxford Brooks University, uh, doing uh, the bachelor's course and, and also doing lectures at, at postgrad. Um, so yeah, um, looking forward um, to see your feedback on the book. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Soham. Uh, I'll just to add very quickly. So as Soham said, with Soham, I we work on uh, various projects related to our design practice, eco-responsive environments. But in addition to that. Um, I am a design council expert and sit on various quality review panels, and I also support teaching at Oxford Brookes University, so that's me. Hello, my name is Sue McGlynn. I think probably most of you know who I am, long-term long -term urban designer, now reinvented as a settlement designer, possibly, 
have to look to Robert to decide that, the name of the urban design group. Um, it's been a long old process, but it's been a, a great process to work alongside both Ian again and also Prachi and Soham. So we're just really interested to re reiterate Soham's point, really interested in your feedback and and relating it to your own experience that you can you can let us know about at the end of the session. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. OK, so do you want to share slides and kick off? Sure. Thank you, Jane, for lovely introductions and uh, thanks everyone for uh, attending our book launch. Um, so as the title suggests, um, this is a practical book about designing the built environment at all scales from buildings to the overall form of settlements. We call it a framework instead of a manual uh, or a guidebook uh, because the book presents a set of ideas that is based on empirical research uh, to provide support in order to solve or respond to the current challenges of built environment that we are all facing across the world. Um, settlement design is an interdisciplinary subject that intersects various fields such as urban planning, architecture, environmental science, sociology, amongst others. Its impact extends to everyone, making it a complex and multifaceted subject. Therefore, it requires a comprehensive understanding of how these different disciplines interact and influence each other. Um, that's why we've tried to put together ideas that draw from various professional fields and available extensive literature on sustainable and regenerative design in the manner of theory of everything, if you like. The idea was to provide a unified framework that combines multiple disciplines into a single comprehensive understanding. It is very much open-ended and absolutely incomplete. We think we are barely scraping the surface here and we would very much appreciate your thoughts and feedback to help it grow and evolve. Um, the process of this thinking started about 14 years ago. Um, we dedicate this book to Ian Mentley, who passed away last year. Ian and Sue, who were co-authors of Classic Responsive Environments, that was published in 1985. And those who have read it would know that um, it was structured around design qualities that mainly focused on opening up of choices and experience of the user. However, it did not quite um, talk much about how to reintegrate human and natural systems, which is a way of creating conditions favorable for a greener, eco-friendly world, otherwise known as being sustainable in popular culture. We saw there was a clear divide or a gap in both practice and academia between the discipline of landscape ecology and the rest of built environment. To put it simply, thinking of humans and nature as somewhat being separate. As we move forward, we are realizing that the gaps between professional boundaries are getting broader and deeper. This mostly happens because of ever increasing complexity in the context of rapid globalization that creates endemic problems of information overload. And to cope with this, any particular designer is driven to take a specialized focus. And due to such hard boundaries, we get so caught up in our own work that we miss how it connects with what others are doing. But the truth is, our work often spills over into the work of other designers, uh, even those who are working on completely different disciplines. This lack of um, understanding of in the interdisciplinary working means that designers of all kinds face the risk of making well-meant decisions that generate infinitely widening chain of unintended consequences. This gets exacerbated by ever increasing scale and speed of urban change driven by human actions, which mark our new Anthropocene age. Therefore, we felt the need to adopt a more integrated and inclusive way of thinking about relationships between human 
and the rest of natural world in order to minimize such unintended consequences through design in the Anthropocene world. And thus was the inception of eco-responsive environments. To create um, an inclusive framework for design, it is important to establish common ground between all stakeholders of the built environment. Whatever their particular interests, all designers and all users share a common need for survival. We therefore draw inspiration from Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics framework that suggests we must make design decisions for a safe and just space that provides fundamental needs for all humans within the means of the planet. This is the space in which the books framework operates. It addresses Anthropocene's ever-changing economic and environmental conditions by developing a design approach that is responsive to human needs whilst ensuring long-term support from planet's life support systems. We call this approach eco-responsive design. To enable this in practice, eco-responsive design approach embraces a complex systems thinking approach, which means there are things within things within things, and they are also interconnected. This kind of thinking is more prevalent in uh, other fields of knowledge like economics, sociology, medicine, etc., but also in landscape and ecology, which we heavily draw from. In complex systems, relationships between elements or things or objects matter more than those objects or things themselves in isolation. Unlike uh, many other systems, settlements are also such complex systems, uh, which means instead of uh, thinking of uh, cities, towns, villages as one large thing, we need to think about them as a set of relationships between different subsystems. So for example, we start with um, land and topography without which uh, you can't have any settlement. Uh, then the land has water system and the green system. Uh, they change at different rates rather very slowly. Then we have the public space system without which we can't get from one place to another. Once laid out, street network cannot uh, be easily altered significantly. Um, then we have the plot system, which lasts centuries, very long, um, but uh, comparatively faster changing than the natural infrastructure and street networks. Um, they are, however, currently facing threats of rapid change as well. On top of plots uh, sits the building system, uh, which is rather short-lived in comparison to the other layers, um, or even lesser these days, being designed for shockingly shorter lifespan of 30 to 60 years. In summary, the four key subsystems of a settlement, uh, the natural infrastructure, public space, plots, buildings, are not just things or objects, but layers that are connected and um, that interact with each other which means change in one of these layers will affect or trigger change in the others. These subsystems, however, are also multi-scalar. For example, the public space system is made up of streets and other public open spaces, which are in turn made up of ground surface, trees, bollards, etc., which in turn are made up of materials and textures and so on. These smaller elements typically change faster than the larger systems they constitute. For example, the trees and plants of natural infrastructure change much faster than the underlying landform, whilst the internal layer of buildings, windows, door knobs um, typically change faster than their overall building structures. Therefore, design decisions of the longer lasting layers need to be fixed at the earliest possible stage. Otherwise, our settlements would suffer from inherited fundamental challenges, which are rather sometimes irreversible. This essentially generated our methodology for um, how to understand and design settlements resulting into our chapter structure. So chapter one 
starts with um, starts at the largest scale, developing framework for creating a natural infrastructure by drawing out maximum affordances from the site's natural capital. Chapters two, three, and four then weave in the public space network, link in the plot structure, and integrate the build form. Chapter five, however, is slightly different to the rest as it explores the implications of decisions made in chapters one to four for multi-sensory experience. Adopting a transdisciplinary design approach, uh, each chapter summarizes relational parameters that enable creative design decisions at varied local situations and generate positive synergies across as many subsystems as possible. We call these um, synergic or impact parameters. The book introduces these design parameters at crucial points within each chapter, serving as spatial design principles to shape our built environment. Many of these design parameters, some more than the others, in essence are transferable across all cultures. In the slides that follow, we would briefly run through the aim and scope of each chapter. So starting with uh, chapter one, uh, this chapter provides a practical guide to understanding landscape ecology, beginning with landforms and integrating blue and green infrastructure, making them easy to integrate into design process. It also explains how landscape design interacts with other uh, design layers, as well as um, its connections with various professional disciplines and identifying areas where specialist expertise is crucial. Essentially, everything we do relies on the services provided by the ecosystem, uh, which are supported by the natural resources. Unfortunately, these services are declining, which threatens the well-being of future generations. To tackle this, we need to change how we design things, focusing on natural resources in innovative ways to meet human needs whilst also protecting the environment. To pursue the same, we start by mapping out a range of positive affordances offered by the natural infrastructure to counter the Anthropocene issues in relation to human needs. This sets a clear agenda for design, such as equitable access to green spaces, integration of uh, sustainable drainage, or promotion of healthy and active lifestyles, um, and guaranteeing access to clean water and fresh air, which eventually becomes part of the design brief that we would be working on on our projects. Currently, there are multifaceted issues surrounding the water system that underscores the urgency and the complexity of challenges we face. From flooding to water scarcity, from agricultural impacts to the cost of sewage treatment, these issues affect communities worldwide, highlighting the need for innovative solutions. Therefore, the book offers um, a regenerative approach to water management by localizing water cycles. That starts with understanding how the patterns of rainfall relates to the topography and the watershed basins in order to create a gravity-fed open water system. This approach can enable water security, reduce reliance on distant water sources, and to raise ecological awareness by showing people how the system works. Chapter one also offers long-term strategies for human health in relation to natural infrastructure. Plant and animal species are disappearing at an ever-increasing um, rate due to human activity, whilst our uh, current carbon intensive lifestyles raise inherent issues of both physical and mental health. Since experience of nature has been shown to enhance our immune function, we need to reimagine our settlements as a highly connected, multi lobed, multifunctional network of green spaces that uses uh, native species linking from the wider countryside to the town's center. 
By enhancing connectivity, we can improve access to nature for all, facilitate movement of organisms throughout the system, thereby enhancing biodiversity and overall biophilic experience. Next on to chapter two, um, which is about linking the public space network. This chapter explains how to strategically and locally connect routes and structure movement, detailing how movement integrates with landscape and build form. It also identifies areas needing design and policy innovation to foster healthy placemaking. From early 20th century, settlements evolved to favor car-centric developments, making car dependency as the default setting for everyday life that contributes to health issues, further straining the ecological balance and also affecting pedestrian and cycling experience. Therefore, to turn tables around, we reimagine the movement and public space system to be a highly connected landscape integrated network that is convenient and safe and attractive for healthful walking, cycling, and play. Uh, this enhances microclimate, um, restores biophilic opportunities within public realm for all, and minimizes energy wastage through unnecessary detours supplemented by cost-effective public transport. This book offers a step-by-step -step approach to achieve a resilient and energy efficient movement system. Next on to chapter three, uh, which is about generating the plot system. This chapter explores how plots integrate with landscape and movement hierarchies to enhance development value. It explains the variation in plot sizes and shapes across different settlement areas and highlights the need to revisit design and policy to ensure the long-term resilience of the plot structure. Um, in many cultures like UK, planners focus on large scale patterns of land uses rather than on the particular plots that house them. Whilst most architects think of activities as contained within buildings, creating the necessary plots a mere byproduct of building design. This blinds designers, planners, and other development stakeholders to the processes through which the plot system affects both streets and buildings. To create eco-responsive settlements, we must rediscover these connections. So at the largest scale, we consider the settlement's transit structure across which the balance of connectivity and biophilic affordances varies systematically. The potential for connectivity is likely to be at its maximum near the town's center, in contrast, the potential for biophilic experience expands as we move towards the country, countryside um, edge. At the next scale down, we take advantage of the levels of connectivity and biophilia embedded within our projects, emerging weave of streets and natural infrastructure to support a diversity of plots in order to host a mix of uses within walkable distances for uh, healthy communities. And finally, at the most local scale, we consider how to best relate uh, particular development types together for mutual benefits on adjacent plots. This is what this chapter is about, meshing the plot structure with more deeper layers to unlock value. Moving on to chapter four, which is about integrating buildings. This chapter, uh, investigates into how architectural innovation can be effectively directed to enhance um, the collective benefits of streets and their contexts. It explains the relationship between buildings, plots, streets, and landscape in promoting regenerative and sustainable placemaking. It also discusses designing resilient and ecologically productive building skins uh, and decoding place character to inform architectural design. We are witnessing a rapid evolution in working patterns and household structures due to a range of uh, socioeconomic issues, such as 
aging population, loneliness, and increased amount of uh, working from home. A mismatch is therefore developing between activity patterns and building design, aggravated by the mainstream design culture of use specific non-adaptable buildings focused on responding to short-term market needs. This contributes to shorter building lifespans with implications on carbon emissions associated with the construction industry and thereby affecting the planetary health. We think that the long life building open up possibilities for sidestepping such pressures in the longer term. Cumulatively, these factors suggests a general argument for slow architecture, um, that is the creation of adaptable buildings that remain useful long enough to cope with more rapid cycles of social and economic change, contributing to settlements overall energy efficiency. As a Stuart Brand puts it, Age plus adaptivity is what makes a building come to be loved. It is also the fundamental um, element uh, in terms of uh, generating the importance for of creating buildings positively to the public space through perimeter development within uh, a multi-plot structure. It is important to note here that we do not see perimeter development as a geometric form for layout configurations, but as a set of relationships that ensure clarity between uh, the public fronts and the private backs of buildings. Moving on to chapter five, which is about um, creating atmospheres by designing the public realm. Um, it outlines a process to refine design decisions um, from previous chapters by focusing on components and materials that create atmospheres, fostering well being in the public spaces. It also highlights opportunities for innovation and uh, processes aimed at enhancing the multi sensory experience of the public realm. So far, decisions made in chapters one to four create spaces which are essentially abstract in nature. In chapter five, our focus is to tune these abstract spaces to shared physical places that benefit its users' sensory experiences and perceptions to engender positive atmospheres. For example, we can think of the decisions made in earlier chapters similar to creating a musical instrument in terms of its structure and body, but it needs to be tuned before its users can play music rather than just making noises. As we actively um, forage our way through the sequence of public spaces, we lay our multi-sensory claims to everything we can perceive. The spatial limits of these claims extend to spaces such as private front gardens, which can be seen, heard, smelled, and touched uh, by the users of the public space. This must therefore be considered as a part of the public space experience together uh, with most publicly used interior spaces of the buildings. We call this widely experienced set of spaces the realm of public claim. This chapter focuses on developing multi-scalar design methodology and parameters for this space uh, in order to enable uh, creation of atmospheres that engender a narrative flow to support a sense of well-being throughout the project. In conclusion, the book outlines our best strategies for designing settlements that tackle the pressure uh, and the challenges of Anthropocene world. However, to translate these ideas into real world benefits, we need both financial backing and political will. To achieve this, we must have the courage to break out of our professional silos and build working alliances with the power structures 
suppliers, producers, and consumers. By doing so, we can maximize social and ecological benefits within the financial and political context we face. The multi-scale design parameters presented in each chapter of the book are merely springboards for creativity. Uh, they are by no means uh, any rigid blueprints for design, but rather needs to be continuously sort of developed and evolved uh, through creative practice. They should be used as a vehicle to shift focus from individual specialisms to collaborative actions, enabling development stakeholders to um, negotiate a balance between short-term financial viability and long-term environmental and social values. In the end, of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Many of you are already integrating eco-responsive design ideas in your own practice, I'm sure. We hope uh, you'll find uh, the multi-scalar framework that we have presented here to be useful and develop it um, further um, through addressing the challenges you face in your projects. Um, so please uh, let us know how you get on. And um, thank you for um, listening to us and we very much now look forward uh, to receiving your comments and any thoughts. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So that's a brilliant glimpse into the book. And I think, you know, there's a huge amount in there. Um, I think this, this sort of whole framework of approach and the sort of multi-scalar approach and the parameters within there are sort of really quite fundamental things, I think, that we entered into um, throughout practice. Um, what would be great now is um, many of you will have sort of had kind of questions that come to mind kind of as you've um, been listening to Soam. Um, it'd be great if you can raise your hand kind of through, um, through the bar at the bottom um, and I can bring people in um, as you want to. While you're all kind of having a bit of a think and kind of formulating your questions though, um, I suppose, you know, clearly, you know, all three of you, it, the book is very much sort of intended to be used and for people to really evolve um, the thinking that you've established. I suppose, how how would you ideally like to see urban designers use the framework in their day-to-day -day work? I suppose, how, how, how do you really want to see it used? Um, I could kick off um, on that. Um, I think firstly, the book is, I think our aspiration is for the book to not just be used by urban designers, of course, including urban designers, but what we feel that one of the things that um, happens as we work as, as an industry um, within the built environment is that urban designers are kind of, you know, given the responsibility of all of the joining up to do between different disciplines. And that's a lot of responsibility. And I think it is time that that responsibility um, is extended and is shared. So yes, urban designers still need to have that responsibility, but it is equally important that other disciplines also understand how their work overspills and relates with other disciplines. So I think one of the things if, you know, if urban designers can uh, sort of, how to use this book in practice is A, uh, to understand how their work, you know, sort of overspills and relates to other disciplines, but equally invite other disciplines um, to go through the same process. I think we all need to be working together and it's really important to have a common frame of reference and sort of design values um, going forward. Fantastic, thank you, Prachi. Yeah, no, I think that sort of raises lots of important points I think about how we all work and the sort of level of responsibility we all feel on this. Um, Graham Freer you've got a question do you want to come in? Yeah sure um, thanks so um, it was uh, beautifully presented uh, it's beautifully illustrated um, very very interesting thank you for that um, yeah my question is really the focus seems to be and I'm not seeing your eyes on the book yet but it seems very much focused on new developments. I don't know whether that's because you see perhaps rapid urban expansion is the big key issue and that that's what we need to address. But, you know, a lot of our cities, uh, so in the UK, are 
pretty established. There's a big challenge about urban expansion, how we achieve that sustainably. Um, um, I'm just wondering, you know, how well the book can be used in, in sort of thinking about kind of uh, urban expansion. I see we've got Brian Love on the call. He could perhaps talk a bit about connected cities. I don't know whether you, you're aware of that model. Yeah, um, yeah. But also thinking about kind of like climate adaption. I mean, original responsive environments, a key key issue was uh, the aspect was about robustness and how we adapt to climate adaption as well and whether that features in the book. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm just conscious I've been speaking for a while. Uh, Sue, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, I'll have a go. I think there's a lot of questions there, which I might not deal with, but but remind me. I think you raised the point about old RE. I think this book doesn't replace old RE. Um, and in many ways, those those principles or those qualities are, are still relevant and used, hopefully. I think. Uh, there's no intention that robustness is not a key theme. It has to be a key theme in everything we do. And there's a real intention that this now should relate to a much wider range of settlement types. So it should relate to all settlement types, I think, from the tiniest hamlet or village right the way through to big metropolitan and even larger settlements. That same framework should should work and operate regardless of the actual scale of the, the place. The problems and the issues, the inputs and the impacts will be different, but I think the frame of reference, hopefully, will be robust in itself to deal with that. Was there something else that I haven't answered that you asked? Um, quite likely. Um, Sorry. Uh, Sue, if I may just add to that, I think what, if I understand it correctly, Graham, um, I think, um, uh, you know, as a part of... Um, you know the, the examples that we illustrate in the book. Uh, we we've tried to use this framework um, to explore brownfield opportunities as well. It's not just about new new settlements, but also how we can retrofit existing settlements. So our project on Heath Park um, uh, is a which is located in Runcorn uh, is an existing um, te sort of tech and business um, campus, which we uh, sort of were involved and engaged um, or, or appointed uh, to look at uh, in terms of how to how to retain the existing infrastructure and stitch it to the context and, and, and again and apply our eco-responsive framework um, to achieve uh, sort of regenerative design strategies. So yes, I, I think the intention is um, that the framework to apply across all design scenarios. Fabulous. Thank you, so and Sue. Um, David Tannerhill's got a question. David, do you want to come in and ask this yourself? Yeah, no problem. Um, just the question really was, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic approach, isn't it? And it's a very ambitious approach, but it's the approach you need to take to deal with um, the climate crisis. So how do you embed this sort of design approach, which... Uh, it you know, needs to be adopted by the whole design team and the whole approval process. How do you embed it in complex and probably fragmented city governance for new development? And um, do you see any way, do you have any examples of where you pull teams together to adopt this ambitious and really spatial planning approach which steps outside the building envelope from the individual plots to a, a master plan approach for city districts or, or city regions. So it's just an interesting, have you thought about the governance issues you, you'd like to tackle? Um, if I just jump in on that one, just to kick things off, um, uh, David, I think the issue around governance is, is a very challenging one because it's it's something that obviously, it, you know, it takes time for things to change, but equally, um, it's also really important that, um, there is a structured approach and process um, and we know what we want to change and where we want to get to so then we can kind of plan a roadmap so in your question you asked about sort of examples where um, we've sort of um, explored this a little bit so 
one side of changing governance structures is also about you need to have really powerful stories and a narrative and storytelling and arguments uh, that you put forward in order to convince uh, stakeholders across the spectrum of the built uh, environment um, to align. Uh, with the yeah. things that matter. Um, and I think one of the things that the framework hopefully offers are uh, at least sort of the starting point, the bones of how to frame such an argument, what kind of data matters, what counts as information when putting together such arguments. Um, and I think we've tried to sort of weave that through the chapters as we build the argument. But equally, uh, as Soham very briefly touched upon, um, we've sort of tried and explored this um, framework in two projects that we worked on. One is the Heath Park project uh, that Soham mentioned. It's a five to 600 brownfield regeneration um, campus site into a mixed use resi uh, zero carbon neighborhood and a 900 home um, extension master plan in Letchworth, which is on a greenfield site. Um, so they're very two sort of very different contexts and 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 part of both these projects were uh, was about a yes understanding best practice and being able to align with the uh, local policy etc cetera, etc cetera, but equally being able to weave a uh, strong narrative and a strong story that that can with evidence so supported and really rooted in a, a sort of nuanced understanding of the site its context um as well as um kind of analytical evidence if I may just quickly yeah, add yeah. to that, Prachi, um, I think also a, a benefit that we had in both of these uh, projects uh, was uh, we were engaged at a very, very early stage, right from the state of uh, competition, um, because that allowed us to influence the design brief that followed uh, into a, you know, much more focused um, uh, sort of you know, stage of you know, going into planning. So uh, I think you know uh, yes we we do need the narrative to convince uh, and change people's mindset but also at the same time uh, we need that to be in we need to be engaging at uh, at a very early stage to make that sort of influence happen. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 agenda. It's the right agenda. It's a very ambitious agenda. So you know. At the moment in the UK, it's probably applies in India as well. You know the challenges from water and sewage, sewage treatment utilities, um, bringing them on board. You know if they're if they're not on board, it's very very difficult. You know bringing all the utilities on board as well as that and looking at nature and the data. Scratch point about collecting the data very hard data you can present the case can't you so getting a critical part of your role really isn't it as master planner and urban designer yeah then you were able to do that in Runcorn and, and Letchworth were you that was that was available to you well done <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess a part of it is sort of, you know, exploring and also understanding practically where you can push boundaries and to what degree, you know, within the context that you're working in. I think in in, in the context of the Runcon Heath, Heath Park project, I think we were fortunate because we had an enlightened client, uh, both for Letchworth and Heath Park. And I think um, they sort of had uh, the environmental uh, as well as sort of social value agenda um, on the top of the priority list and obviously equally important is the financial viability and getting the return on um uh, you know on land value etc but uh, it's really important that the design brief and um yeah sort of sets the scene well then for designers to sort of come in and um, try and coordinate and, and and play our part yeah thank you fantastic no re really important point thank you David for bringing that um, into the discussion. Um, so please do um, keep it and sort of put, pop your hands up or put questions into the chat if um, that's easier. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the aspects um, is that you got, you know, that bringing the book forward has taken time. A lot of that has been the research you guys have done in the background and trying to glean and filter what is most relevant from urban designers and sort of doing the job for many of us for us. Um, I suppose 
in doing all of that research, were there any real light bulb moments where you sort of really kind of came across something that suddenly opened up a new way of thinking or a sort of solution um, on things? Or any sort of points of those that might be quite interesting for others to hear? Perhaps if I can start on that one and maybe Prachi and Soham add to it. But um, I suppose, I mean, it, it has been a very long time that we've been writing this book. Uh, it's been very protracted, perhaps unnecessarily so. But it, it started a long time ago with Ian Bentley and I trying to do or update, make a second edition of Old Responsive Environments. But what we found, um, so the, the first light bulb moment happened a very long time ago. So what we found when we tried to pull it apart and sort of update it and change, that the whole the whole thing did actually fall apart and it didn't start to hang together in that nice sort of simply easily employable way that it that it has around structured around those seven qualities of place for user experience. And it was only geared towards the user responsiveness of a place. So we the the first light bulb moment, I suppose, was the switch to um the, the morphological layers approach, i.e., the relationship of the things we see in a settlement that relate to both the time and the spatial elements of that place so you know using and perhaps morphology has traditionally been used very much in an urban context of urban morphology so it's confined itself more to streets pots buildings so we wanted to add to that understanding of place in terms of time and what lasts the longest and therefore we need to think hardest about those and longest about those and get those rightest before we move on to the other the other kind of layers and the other resolutions that we have to make as designers to design a, a place. So that, that was the first uh, light bulb moment to shift from a qualities approach to um, a morphological approach, really. Um, other than, I don't, shall I carry on or do you want to, to add? I was only going to say in, inevitably in a process like that, there have been you know, hundreds of light bulb moments, probably every time we got together virtually or face to face. Um, and that's the benefit, I guess, or maybe that's what took so long of having a diverse team with different experience, different backgrounds and so on. So there were an awful lot of light bulb moments, changes in direction. Sometimes the light was switched off again. And, you know, we so um, it, but it, it's a it's a process, you know, that we had to go through to keep you know, it's that iterative process like design, isn't it? Writing a book is you, mm. you know, you, you make a high hypothesis about something, you investigate it and then you have to repropose it. And it was exactly the same with the book, really. Yeah, I think so. You've summarized it really well, to be honest. I think just one small thing is sometimes when you talk about like light bulb moments we sort of relate them to you know points or junctures where you you know come across this idea a radical idea and it's really important to remember that radical ideas never uh, are never born in vacuum um creativity sort of ignites when different ideas collide and what sue was saying about diverse people and teams coming together and working on a, a shared project i think that's a really powerful way so the more we discuss and talk about issues with different disciplines and the whole spectrum of stakeholders within the built environment. I think, yeah, we need to go through an era of light bulbs, not just, not just, not just the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if I also just followed that up, um, I mean, I think one of the light bulb moments that I can think of um, was when we stumbled upon, um, you know, the concept of, uh, ecosystem services, not that anything new about it, but uh, when we realized uh, that how that uh, can be a very useful argument um, to convey a message uh, to people who are not related to the landscape ecology and vice versa, uh, or, or for landscape people from landscape ecology to under understand more about um, you know uh, other layers of built environment. So, you know, that was just being one of those instances where we found those critical moments of of um, triggering interlayer, interdisciplinary narrative hooks, um, which is, you know, uh, which we have a few in, 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 in the book. But um, yeah, uh, that was something that I do remember back uh, in 2010. <laughs> so, yes, one specific moment, though. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. No, that's really lovely kind of insight into 
how I think how the thought process is evolved and the sort of conversation has been quite fundamental to that. Um, right, we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I'm going to say your name wrong. I know I am. Um, Ms. Happy, do you want to come in? Uh, thanks, uh, Jane. Uh, you got that perfectly right. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> um, yes, um, I just wanted to um, uh, commend uh, the uh, the team uh, for their brilliant work on the book. Um, uh, it looks fantastic and it reads really well. Um, uh, that level of you know sort of simplicity in in, in conveying um, uh, complex ideas is is not easy to achieve, um, and I think it you know it it it, it works really well. Um, uh, I remember seeing some earlier versions that um, uh, Ian sort of showed me um, over the years, and you know so it, it's really come a long way. Um, my question um, <clears throat> um, is around I suppose one of the issues that tended to be raised uh, in some quarters around um, uh, the Responsive Environments um, uh, book itself, uh, that it, it didn't sufficiently, uh, at the time, um, uh, address um, uh, diverse cultural approaches that there might be uh, to urban design. Um, and so my question is, how, how do you think that the current approach helps to overcome that? Who wants to start a go? Go for it, Sue. Oh, okay. That's a very a good and complex question, though. I, I think thank you for your very positive and kind comments about the book. Uh, it's really good to hear that. Um, I think we very deliberately, we were very aware that old RE, kind of not intentionally, but it turned out like, I know Graham is here, so he might want to, Graham Smith, he might want to add, but it was very focused in UK practice, I think. So this time we tried very much to look at, again, much wider context of geographies, cultures, and so on. However, I think, um, and of course those will vary hugely from place to place, and you can't write a book about everywhere, I suppose, is 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 one answer. So what we've tried to do is to understand through the literature that's available, the people we've tested the ideas out on the projects where the, the project, the project where the, the book uh, has been tested, to find those uh, shared and agreed areas. Uh, for instance, let me name one perhaps about privacy and publicness. Although detailed practices will vary in different cultures, I think most cultures do have um, attitudes and spatial responses to privacy and community, for instance. So the fact that we're trying to set out the common agenda that will then be positively interpreted by the people who really know, i.e. the people who are designing and working in that place, are the ones, it's a frame of reference, mm. not, um, not a design manual, as, as Prachi said right at the start. And hopefully by giving people... Um, this frame of reference, they can then use it in a creative and positive way in the places where they live and design and, and work. So I hope that's that's some answer to your, your question. Um, if not, come back at us and then I'll pass it over quickly to Prachi or Sohan. <laughs> no, no, that works, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you, Sue. Um, right, we've got a question from Paul. Paul, do you want to come in and then Maddie afterwards? Yeah, too. Yeah, it was just a kind of it was a question really about the um the slide you had on chapter three where you've sort of the transect from urban to rural. Um I mean I think it's quite a noticeable thing, obviously, the shift in recent years actually towards bringing nature into our urban areas a lot more. Um with the urban design group conference is gonna have a theme this year around um towards the urban renaissance that um mm. urban task force report came out 25 years ago this week actually um so i've been kind of rereading that in preparation for the conference and sort of thinking about you know what would you change if you were going to be recommissioning that piece of you know, that exercise today and actually the really noticeable thing is a lack on anything to do with greening i think the word tree is only in it about three times and greening was not in it and you know it's it's a notable change and i was kind of i think what you presented is really really interesting but i was just wondering whether 
there is a kind of next step, which is to go even more radical in terms of the level to which we can incorporate that kind of green and natural into the um, urban element. Absolutely, Paul. Um, sorry, I just jumped, jumped in, um, Prachin. So, um, I think, um, well, the bi biophilic and biodiversity opportunities are probably going to be maximum uh, at the edge of uh, any town or settlement. But uh, we ought to look at how we shape um, and uh, sort of retrofit our existing settlements to maximize even more opportunities biophilic opportunities at the center of, of any town or cities. Um, I mean, there are a few examples, um, you know, in cases of Copenhagen and Singapore, where they've sort of looked at it at, at a very, very wide sort of bigger scale in terms of sort of green fingers literally coming to the sort of heart of the town. And if we have a, an intention towards making that happen, then we, I'm sure, you know, uh, there are amazing design thinkers to make it happen, to see how we can use uh, smaller interventions or stepping stones to achieve sort of longer uh, sort of green structures coming in to the center of the settlement from, from the countryside. And I think something, something to explore. Yeah, I think the um, one of the, I don't know if you recall the slideshow that Soham showed uh, near the beginning, talking about the multi-scalar aspect of design going from, you know, right from the big moves, as he's just talked about, of, of for instance, green, green spaces, green corridors coming right through and threading through. But it also goes down to street trees, for instance. It goes even to front gardens. It goes to window boxes. You know, I think we need to think about increasing the, the green and the presence of green and the experience of green in all settlements. Obviously, the bigger the settlement, the more pressing it becomes. Um, so I think that to keep that multi-scalar um, idea in mind is, is really, really important. I, I think the other thing, this is a bit of a glib answer, but it's certainly something I've noticed hugely in the in projects, master planning projects primarily I've been involved with, where there's the most opportunity, I suppose, to kind of look to the future and design for the future rather than design for now. Um, and, and that is to make space, make space for green, you know, to, to think about, you know, we got very, everyone always says about, you know, everywhere's got like everywhere else because it's the standard house design. Well, I actually don't think it's that necessarily. I think it's the standard layout design that's really at the heart of the problem. It's really at the core of the problem with standardized layouts, standardized streets, standardized street widths. And we know where those issues come from, I think. But actually, you actually have to examine every single opportunity to make space within that kind of default offering to push it apart. Where can I make a wider street that maybe has rain gardens or rain gardens or other kind of green and blue features running through it? How can I make a wider space um, sometimes between buildings, at the back of buildings? How can I respect rather than cross through um, a line of green infrastructure. So, I, you know, I think we have to all the time examine the standards mm. that we've been using and, and really start to think hard about where we can, how we can incorporate more green. Sometimes it might mean having very dense areas of a settlement where buildings are very contiguous and joined up so that you leave a very important, wider, bigger green space. It, it has to be that kind of to and fro discussion, and you do actually have to make space for it. Both, you know, the the local water management, the green infrastructure, all of those issues that we're aware of and that we we talk about in the book. You actually do have to make it spatial. It's not just an idea, and it's not just putting the you know the balancing pond in the corner of the site somewhere. It's actually thinking how that is integrated through the whole mm. whole development. And I suppose that leads to beyond my other kind of. Um, I suppose the, the, the really important message was, you know, we have to draw all those ideas for design from the place itself, not go with this default pattern book sort of here urban design, I know how to do that. We actually have to draw from place. And that means always starting beyond the site boundary, much wider over, you know, never start design inside the site boundary, go much wider. And I should also give a plug now for Roger Evans' new paper for the Urban Design Group, which I think touches on a lot of these issues. 
you know, in, in his case, it's about, you know, how, how do we make better town form? But it, it's actually dealing with perhaps not the green issues so much, but those ideas about land allocation, how we connect places better, how we think about where we place new development. I think it's a really, really good new publication for and, and on behalf of the urban design group. So, you know, that that idea of constantly thinking beyond bounded sites, always, always and going into the wide, it doesn't matter if it's a landscape setting beyond the edge mm. of a settlement, or even in a densely urbanised context, you still have to go beyond the site. You have to understand more things are fixed, I suppose, in big existing cities, because the, the movement framework is largely there. The street block framework is largely there. It's thinking, therefore, within those parameters, how you might design. But And it's even more critical then that you think about the multiscalar nature of introducing green and the presence of green into design. I think just just adding very briefly to what Soham and Sue have said uh, regarding integration of green, I think legislation and also approaches, sort of innovation in approaches towards stewardship and management is critically important, something that needs further discussion and really sort of debate. Uh, I mean, obviously, there, is, has, there has been a big step change with the Environment Act, but equally, Environment Act focuses on new developments, whether they are expansion, mm -hmm. um, settlements or otherwise. It's really important. I mean, a lot of our cities, uh, the core of our cities, um, you know, have limited green space. And it's really important to think it's a greater challenge on how you retrofit and make most of mm. what green space exists within a city in comparison to being able to design a new settlement or an expansion settlement where you have more freedom and flexibility to incorporate and think about green spaces as Sue outlined. So uh, there is, I mean, there is a lot of focus around retrofitting buildings for en energy efficiency, the old building stock, but uh, so far, uh, the, the same argument for public space and for green spaces, I think, uh, is there as well and, and something that, hmm. yeah, that, that should be uh, probably discussed, debated and, and taken forward at kind of uh, administration and sort of political levels as well. So oh, brilliant. Yeah, I think all the really important themes of quite this sort of sense of the retrofitting and quite the level of challenge of when we want to prioritise this, what it actually really means, it kind of goes back a bit to, I think, sort of David's points on governance that we were talking about at the beginning as well. Um, Maddie, do you want to come in with your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the detail and specific presentation of the book. Um, I'm a master's student and I'm doing my dissertation. And uh, your book actually is one of my sources <laughs> for my literature. So um, my project is uh, designing a new housing scheme in an urban rural fringe. And uh, as I like, uh, like the last question was about how integrating like green infrastructure and landscape design. And, but my question is how we can fit your framework for an inclusive and climate resilient strategy, like in a rural, uh, rural fringe, like how, how we can use that. It's just like, because, for example, I, I'm studying, uh, I'm working on my project in Dundee, University of Dundee. So uh, Scotland is uh, has a lot of 97% uh, rural areas, which has greenery and uh, the climate uh, action, the climate resiliency is really important uh, for designing and adding new schemes. So how we can fit that into this because we all, we already have green areas but we also have like housing crisis and we are adding new housing and new housing schemes like and we are targeting like rural areas so how how we can just like have a strategy a right strategy according uh to your knowledge uh that is my question who wants to go anyone Prachi, Prachi, you go for it. <laughs> oh gosh, it's uh, Matty. Thank you for the question. It's one of those questions where you like, you know, you like for example, if if I'm unwell or something, I want to go to the doctor and I want to ask for this one pill that can solve everything. Um, 
So it's a, it's a complex question. Obviously, climate resilience needs to be at the heart of everything we do now across the uh, all the layers of um, the built environment, uh, starting from landscape, uh, streets, plots, buildings. But when you think about designing and your question about how to integrate uh, inclusive and climate resilient sort of way of thinking into your project, it's really important to, uh, probably the starting point needs to be what are the important questions in relation to each layer um, you know, that pertain to climate resilience? So for instance, if it comes to water cycle, what are your local issues regarding water? Um, how does the local water cycle need to respond? How does it relate to the wider watershed? And I think the book sort of outlines, um, you know, or at least exposes the readers to uh, the fundamentals of, of some of these um, aspects. Uh, I think regarding green again, what about your area um, uh, needs to change in order to make it climate resilient? Uh, you know, is there lack of green mm. space? Is there green space, but it's like sort of just lawn? Does it need to be like kind of have more structural and ecological diversity, for example? So, which is why we say that what we put in the book is just a framework. It, it It's mm. kind of prompts that needs to catalyze the kind of hopefully it, it you know there are prompts to uh for the reader or the user to sort of understand what what might be relevant to understand and to find more information about um and and then to stitch it, you know as part of your design process um it's also really important when it comes to climate resilience is um, it's not just about the kind of, um, you know, sort of what is best practice design, but also about the process of design and the, and the, and the project management sides of design. So the sequence of, of mm. how you layer and you develop a design is equally important to just knowing what is good design. And, and so uh, like if you, uh, if you are developing a project and, you know, you, you should be going through a particular sort of a strategic sequence starting from larger scale and then sort of going, then zooming in sequentially uh, and starting from the deeper layers and sort of unlock key questions that then go back to your climate resilience agenda. I'm not sure if I've been able to be helpful on this question, but Maddie, you can follow up with, with a follow-up question if you need to. Was that helpful? Yes, um, that was like uh, the steps that I have to take for this. And I'm just uh, because it's a very broad and it's a very challenging to topic. Yeah, yeah like uh, like in, pra in practice, not only in research mm. uh, at the school or at the university. It's just uh, this is like uh, my only passion <laughs> that how I can find like an answer yeah. to it and I'm just like like what you said it's like when you go to a doctor and just like I want one medication or just one medicine for this and it's it's not like that it has a, a very big system absolutely of, yeah um, just just to help with that Maria a bit um I mean a doctor can only help you if if, if um if they ask you the right questions uh, and I think, therefore, if, if you wanted to write and know the right answers or find what you know the solutions, one need to ask relevant questions. And perhaps the framework for asking those relevant questions is we, what what we offer in the book. And you know, what, one of the examples of you know being uh, ask questions of the human needs of the area uh, and, and any particular needs that are not being met. And how you know ecosystem services can provide or or is affecting certain you know uh, basic human needs. So maybe that could become a sort of a, a initial pointers to come up with a list of questions, and then you explore, and then that leads to more, and and it goes on, and see where the rabbit hole leads to. And I guess that would need to be for each layer. So, for example, although we, you know, focus on green and blue, it's equally important to understand what about building design will contribute to long-term climate resilience. Things like, you know, spa simple things like spatial depth of buildings matter a lot in the long term. You know, floor to floor height, so buildings can actually adapt to change of uses. That matters a lot as well, particularly in the ground floor. So, hopefully, the the book will sort of have. A, a range of ideas that can then sort of prompt you and propel your thinking forward. But looking forward to uh, the progress on your dissertation, Maddie. Thank you so much.
brilliant fantastic thank you um that was a really good kind of discussion to kind of go forward on. i think we are coming towards the end we're sort of due to finish in about four minutes are uh, i suppose sue patty so um any sort of final things sort of aspects that we've perhaps not covered or anything that sort of you sort of burning things you wanted to say um before we kind of close Let's just say quickly, Jane, it was something you discussed with us when we had a little pre-meet about today, and uh, which is how, how the book will be used, which comes out of Maddie's question in a way, partly in some of the earlier questions. I think it, it's two th- I mean, in part, it's a, at the most pragmatic level, it's a source book, you know, in the way that the Urban Design Compendium was a source book. We hope this is a source book for settlement design in that it has that, that wider frame of reference. But it's also... Probably more than old RE. It's a, and a, one of our colleagues said, oh, it's a theory of everything. It's got so many ideas on every page. So it's, it's, where's its theory higher above the waterline? Old RE, you know, all the theory was very much, you know, below the waterline with just these sort of seven qualities popping up for us to use in design. This one, more of the theory is visible. So I think it can be used in both ways. You can use the theory in a kind of, sort of sequential read if you want to use the book that way or you can just use it as a source book or go into something because of a particular issue you might have like uh, Maddie was talking about particular issue you might have and then let it ripple out back out into the other kind of layers or scales of design so hopefully it'll operate on on both of those in both of those kind of ways thank you so much brilliant thank you Sue okay well um I think Thank you to everyone for, I think that's been a really good discussion. And I think like, I think the authors are really keen to that this continues that discussion. And, you know, this book sort of marks a really important point in moving discussion forward. Um, So thank you all for joining us. Um, But thank you particularly to Soam Prachi and Sue um, for giving us a great window um, into the book. And also I think particularly for all the work that went into it and the time and the effort and all of that which I I know was extensive um obviously kind of key thing is that sort of it we really want to see sort of everyone using this book um it is available at all good bookshops so please um do kind of you know take the opportunity to kind of dive into it and push that conversation forward that would be brilliant um so Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the authors. Thank you, um, um, Design Group. Um, do kind of keep abreast of um, future events. There'll be future events. And um, we've got one on the 10th of July, um, Better Streets to Stations, and lots of other events coming forward. Um, so, and we can keep conversations like this going um, through the events. So, thank you, everyone. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Patrick Soam, and Sue.